Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Don. Uh, I'm a third year at uh, UCLA School of Dentistry, and I will be lecturing to you guys about PFM crowns today. I'm very grateful. Let me just start by saying I'm very grateful to uh, basic dental principles at UCLA for giving me this opportunity to create this slideshow and lecture to young bright minds like you guys, Pidano students, and also to Dr. Morgan for all of his tips uh, on making this presentation um, accurate. Okay, um, so let me start uh, this presentation with this photo here. So in this photo, you can see that there is a very large architecture here. So I'm from South Korea. And this architecture is from South Korea. It's called the uh, Lotte World Tower. It was actually um, open to the public uh, three years ago in 2017. However, this building took about 20 years of uh, planning and construction to finally become open to the public. So 13 years of planning and seven years of construction. So 13 years of planning for this magnificent architecture. And thanks to that, thanks to all that engineering and planning, um, this, this architecture is not only beautiful on the outside, you can see that it's a very, very beautiful architecture, but also it, it is designed to be able to withstand earthquakes up to 9.0 scale in magnitude on the Richard scale, and also hurricane level winds. So, it, it, so I thought this architecture uh, was a great representation, sort of as a metaphor to PFM crowns because it boasts not only beauty, but also strength, thanks to its brilliant design. Okay, now let's dive into the presentation. Uh, okay, so let's start with basics. So since you guys are not dental students, I wanna start by, um, start with what is a crown? So a crown, um, you guys probably think of it as like a cap over a tooth, if you guys have seen it before. Um, to be specific, it is a full coverage restoration. So full coverage meaning it covers all surfaces of a tooth, all five surfaces of a tooth, and an indirect restoration. Indirect meaning it's not made directly in the mouth, but it's made outside the mouth indirectly, right? Uh, an example of a direct restoration is a filling because that's done directly in the mouth and you're done. An indirect restoration is they first prep your teeth into a crown prep, sort of like a nub shape where the crown's gonna go on top of it. So they prep your teeth and then you go home and then um, they, they would have taken an impression of that prep, sent to the lab and the lab will fabricate the crown. So it's made outside the mouth, the crown. Then on the second appointment, the crown will be delivered. So that's why it's called the indirect restoration. It usually takes about two appointments to complete. And the purpose of a crown is to ultimately emulate the function, shape, size of a normal tooth crown. And in the case of ceramic um, or porcelain fused metal crowns, we also try to emulate the shade of a normal tooth. Of course, gold is not going to emulate the shade of, shade of a normal tooth. And there's different types um, that are commonly used today in practice. Um, gold crown, entirely made of gold. And there's also PFM, which is the topic of interest today. And there's also PFZ, which is porcelain fused zirconia. I'm not gonna go into details about different types of ceramic, but zirconia is a type of ceramic, the strongest type of ceramic that we have in terms of dental materials. An all ceramic crown that can be porcelain, lithium disilicate, or zirconia. And let me also quickly go over notation uh, uh, when I refer to surfaces, uh, a typical uh, particular surface of a tooth. And I'm going to go over incisor surfaces today because the lab you guys are going to be doing later on uh, as part of BDP is number nine PFM crown. So that's an incisor. It's the it's the middle incisor on the left side right here. That's number nine. So an incisor has five surfaces, just like any other teeth. And the front surface is called facial because it's on the same side as the face. It's also interchangeable as labial, as you can see on the picture. And the back side is called lingual. The back side is also interchangeable as palatal because it's on the palate side or the lingual, AKA the tongue side, right? The inside. The incisal is the edge, the top edge of the um, uh, tooth, it's called the incisal edge. And mesial is 
is the side of a tooth that's in between two teeth. But, you know, there's two sides of one tooth that is in between two teeth, right? In the contact areas, right? The one that's facing towards the front, so this one in the middle is the mesial, and one that's facing towards the back, this one is distal, okay? And so when I refer to mesial facial, it's this one and this one, right? So it's MF, mesial facial. So that's for notation. And some quick anatomy here. This is the back surface of the incisor. And you can see um, at, the, at the top here, it's, you see the cervical line. That's where the crown of the tooth ends and the cementum begins. Enamel ends and cementum begins. So the root begins right here. Um, it's also called the CEJ, cement, cemento enamel junction. And right above it, you have a, a small convexity called the cingulate. And above it, above that, you have a lingual fossa the con concavity. And you have the mesial marginal ridge, distal marginal ridge, and the, the incisal edge. Quiz number one. So throughout the uh, lecture, I'm gonna have quizzes here and there to make sure you guys are you know, listening and engaged with the lecture to get you guys thinking a little bit here. So very easy, which surfaces of an incisor does a crown cover, All right? It will be MIDFL, it's mesial incisal distal, Facial, lingual, all five surfaces. Remember, crown is a full coverage restoration. When to use a, now let's talk about when to use a crown over a filling, right? Um, so one common indication for using a crown over a filling is when there's a large decay, not a small one, a large one, right? And large decay, oftentimes when you remove the decay, you have very little tooth structure remaining. And there's a certain point where, a certain threshold where if you go over that, the tooth, a filling is not enough. A filling is not enough to hold the tooth together. And you will need a crown sort of to brace the tooth from all sides because a lot of tooth structure has been lost. And, uh, and oftentimes that's due to large decay. Another reason is to, um, when a tooth receives a root canal therapy. Root canal therapy, uh, you remove the nerve, the blood supply, essentially the food, the food nutrient supply of the tooth. And Data shows that root canal treated teeth are often susceptible to a fracture. Maybe the tooth structure is not as strong as before because its food supply has been cut off. It becomes more brittle. Also, a lot of tooth structure has been lost because of decay and also root canal therapy. Also, you remove some tooth structure. So usually, a crown is a good idea after a tooth has been root canal treated. Uh, cracked tooth, also um, a good indication for crown because oftentimes, uh, if a crack is really if, if the tooth fractures in a, a large a large piece of it falls off and you have little tooth structure remaining you would have to do some kind of a buildup and then put a crown over the tooth if it's a small chip you can get away with the filling and oftentimes people with acid erosion uh, people with acid reflux uh, chronic acid reflux they have um, t back surfaces of the teeth often eroded away top and back surfaces and that's a lot of tooth structure that's lost right and in addition, you want to protect the rest of the teeth by putting a crown on the tooth. You also want to, um, another indication is to restore function of the um, dentition. And a, a common um, indication for this is worn teeth and oftentimes caused by grinding, chronic bruxism. Bruxism is chronic grinding. You, we often call these patients bruxers. And as you can see, this patient on the top right has grinded their teeth down to flatness, right? So these teeth will need solid crowns to reinforce the rest of the teeth and also to be able to handle um, grinding forces. Um, sometimes we would also give them a night guard to protect the restorations because they will be continuously grinding, right? Whether there's a crown or not, they'll be grinding. Grinding is not stopped by just putting a crown on the tooth, right? And also aesthetics, um, if you want to change the color of a tooth, um, uh, one good example is when, you, uh, when somebody has taken tetracycline when they were young, it's an antibiotic. And tetracycline is known to stain your teeth when you're young, okay? Because it sort of like incorporates into the enamel. And for these teeth, you would have to pretty much replace uh, uh, the tooth structure all around to change the shade of the tooth, the color. Um, and also, sometimes you need to change the shape of a tooth, 
And a good example is congenital pec laterals as on the bottom right, bottom, um, right, right here. These two lateral incisors, you can see they're like tiny and pointy and these are genetically like this. And um, these teeth will need crowns in order to restore into proper shape. But we're talking about crowns here, but I want to make a disclaimer that you don't always have to crown. There's a lot of alternatives. There's partial coverage restorations like three-fourths crown, seven-eighths crown, veneers, onlays, um, and yeah, like veneer lay. There's, a, there's so many different types of partial restoration that is not covering the, every, the entire surfaces of the crown. Um, I think the recent trend lately in dentistry is conservative dentistry. Crown should be the last resort, especially in anterior teeth. Okay. Quiz number two, which is not an indication of a crown overfilling, okay? Keyword is not, right? All right, extensive erosion, that's a good indication of a crown. You have to protect the rest of the teeth. Root canal treated teeth, they often fracture, good indication for a crown. Crack tooth, depends on how bad the crack is. If it's a large crack, good indication for a crown. Any decay between teeth, not necessarily. It has to be a large decay. Small decay can be um, restored with a filling. Texture segment staining, good indication for a crown. You want to change the shade of the overall shade of the tooth. But keep in mind, like I said, crown should be a last resort. Um, oftentimes, texture segment staining can also be treated with veneers, which cover the facial surfaces only. What is a PFM crown? Now, uh, main topic of today's presentation, PFM stands for porcelain fused to metal. So as you can see in the picture on the right here, the inside is made of metal and on the outside is porcelain and they're fused together. It was developed by um, Abraham Weinstein in the 1950s as an alternative to porcelain jacket crowns. Before the advent of PFM crowns, porcelain jacket crowns were uh, popular because they're tooth colored. However, the problem was um, they're porcelain and they often fracture. Um, and back then we didn't know how to bond. Um, bonding wasn't a thing in, back then. It was all about retention form. So back then, crowns could not be bonded to, to, to teeth. They were just slipped on the tooth, not bonded. So there were more fractures since porcelain is not strong. It's not a very strong material. So reinforcing porcelain with metal underneath like a PFM crown was a good, good alternative because it provided strength. The restoration did not fracture anymore. And another bonus is metal margins are more fine than porcelain margins. And if you have a fine margin, um, there's less space in between the tooth and the, and the crown, right? Where the crown meets the tooth, there is less space, which means less chances of bacteria getting inside underneath, right? Okay, and PFM crown, if you peel it away, the innermost layer is made of metal. It's very strong, provides, it's a main source of strength for the crown. However, it's dark because it's metal. Oh, and on top of the metal, they have opaque porcelain. And the purpose of this is to mask the darkness. So this porcelain is very, very opaque and white, almost like chalky white. And this masks the metal. However, it's not natural. It's not a natural color as a tooth because tooth is not chalky white. It has a, it has a little bit of translucence and a little bit of yellowish tint, right? And the body porcelain, is the most translucent um, tooth-like shade um, uh, uh, porcelain on that crown. So what does this mean when we have three layers? So we need enough room, you know, for, for all three layers to um, be there, right? So that means when you prepare the teeth for a crown prep, you gotta prepare enough so that there's enough space for all three layers to coexist. So, Let's go, now that I've uh, talked about what PFM is, let's talk about its sort of uh, pros and cons. And I think a great way to do that is to compare it to uh, the gold crown or the all ceramic crown. So let's look at aesthetics. PFM, I would say is average here in terms of aesthetics. Gold crown completely loses in terms of aesthetics uh, because it's not tooth colored. All ceramic crown, um, wins here. It's a completely natural, the most natural looking crown. 
Fracture Toughness, Gold Crown wins here. Coral Infuse Metal, still about average there. And All Ceramic Crown loses because it is the most brittle. Ceramics are more brittle and they break more frequently than metals. And Longevity, Gold Crown also wins here. Cost Efficiency, All Ceramic Crowns win because it is the cheapest material, except when it's an aesthetic case. However, PFM has never lost, right? And the reason is, it is a beautiful amalgamation of both metal and ceramic, right? So porcelain offers the aesthetic advantage that an all ceramic crown offers. On the outside, it is aesthetic. And on the inside, it offers the fracture toughness of a full gold crown, right? Thanks to that, its longevity is quite long, comparable to a gold crown. And cost is right about in between the gold and a ceramic crown. So you sort of have a best of both worlds with PFM crowns. So beauty and strength, what more can you ask, right? Okay, let's go over some indications while we're at here. So gold crown, um, it's, the strong, it's the strong, toughest material, longest lasting. You wanna use it on people with heavy bite forces like broxers or in areas where there's low aesthetic demand like back teeth. And also ceramic crown, you wanna use it on front teeth where there's a higher aesthetic demand or if the patient just wants tooth color crown even if it's a back teeth or if a patient has metal allergy, you wanna use ceramic. And porous infused to metal, um, you can use it pretty much for any situation. Uh, moderate to heavy bite, perfectly okay. You can use it on molars as well, back teeth. Uh, moderate to high aesthetic demand, you can use it as well because it is aesthetic, it's tooth colored. Um, the, thing, the thing with um, PFMs and full gold crowns, another advantage they have over ceramic crowns is that they, are, they don't need isolation. Isolation meaning um, isolation of the tooth away from saliva, right? So you often we usually use a rubber dam to isolate the tooth away from saliva um, because with all ceramic crowns, especially porcelain and lithium disilicate crowns, we, we often bond the crown to the tooth structure. And in order to achieve a good bond, we have to isolate the tooth from the saliva, right? And that makes it more technique sensitive and a little bit more difficult. Um, so oftentimes, uh, if it's an easier situation to isolate, you can use an all ceramic crown. If it's a difficult situation to isolate, then Fugo crown or PFM crown might work better in some people's hands. All right, quiz number three, what is true about PFMs? It combines aesthetics and strength. Of course, that is what I've been harping about this entire time, right? It is the longest lasting crown. It's, cruelly, it's pretty long lasting, but remember from longevity standpoint, if you have to compare, a gold crown still wins. It is the most aesthetic crown. It is very aesthetic, but if you had to compare, all ceramic would win, right? It has metal in between two porcelain layers. No. You have opaque porcelain between the translucent porcelain and the metal. Metal is the innermost layer, right? Quiz number four, your patient, this is a case scenario, okay? Your patient who grinds teeth wants a tooth colored model crown. Keep in mind, grinding teeth, heavy bite forces, and tooth colored, high aesthetic demand, and molar, back, back teeth. Back teeth often have higher bite forces. What crown is best for the patient? All ceramic crown is a tooth colored crown, but it is not strong enough for a grinder, right? So all ceramic crown is out of the picture. Porcelain fused to metal, probably the best option. Full gold crown, it is good for a grinder, but it is not tooth colored. So we go with PFM. This is a unique situation where PFM is the only option of choice. <laughs> when a patient demands aesthetics and uh, you need a str strong material, then PFM is the perfect choice. Okay, now we're gonna go in depth into the steps of preparation of a tooth into a crown prep for a PFM, okay? The crown preparation for full gold crown or PFM or all ceramic, they, they, they differ a little bit. So this is specific for incisor, number nine incisor PFM crowns. So this is an overview. So this is, a, you know, it might be a lot of numbers here, but I'm gonna go over it, break it down step by step. So pay attention, this is important. This is an important part of the lecture. You guys will be following this guideline for your lab portion. All right, it's gotta be seven steps. Are you ready? Let's get started. 
Okay, step one, even before, even before you touch the tooth, you gotta do an aesthetic evaluation. So aesthetic evaluation consists of two components. You have to decide wh uh, where to place the margin of the crown. Is it gonna be above the gum line or below the gum line? Above the gum line, it's easier to do, right? Because you're not, you're not, you're not gonna risk damaging the gum and you can see really well, right? But if it's below the gum line, it's a little bit harder, but it's going to be more aesthetic, right? Because the margin between the, the, the interface between the tooth and the crown, that's the margin, will not show because it's below the gum line, right? Um, so subgingival, more aesthetic, but a little more difficult. Supergingival is less aesthetic, but easier. However, if you match the shade very well, even super gingerly, it can look good if you match the shade very well. And you gotta, you gotta decide what type of margin will the crown have, right? So for PFMs, uh, for the purposes of this lab, uh, we're gonna have two types of margins, okay? One will be porcelain butt joint. And you can see on the, on the left figure right here that I'm pointing to the porcelain butt margin, you have the tooth right here and then and then the crown ends as porcelain. So porcelain is what shows at the margin, right? And underneath, it'll be metal, right? So this is a butt, butt joint, a 90 degree margin with porcelain leading the tooth. And metal collar is actually a different. You can see right here, a metal collar margin is a different type of margin. It actually ends in metal, right? Porcelain ends right here on top of metal and then the rest is metal and then you have the tooth, right? Uh, it's not 90 degrees, it's a shallower margin, and it has a better seal than a porcelain margin. Remember, porcelain jack and crowns didn't have as much of a good seal as PFM crowns because metal margins are finer than porcelain margins, which means you get a better seal, meaning less room for bacteria to get inside. And some gingival porcelain margins can be very aesthetic. This is an example of PFM crowns done by an extraordinary dentist and it's done very well. Very natural looking, and you cannot even see where the margin is because it's hidden by the gums. For our project, for you guys, um, it'll be super gingival, so above the gum line. And on the facial side of the tooth will be a porcelain butt joint, and on the lingual side will be a metal collar margin. I'm going to detail about how to create those margins later. All right, now we're gonna actually start drilling. And the first step is incisal reduction. So we're gonna reduce the incisal edge first. So we're gonna use this, bur this specific carbide burr called 57010. It's about one millimeter in diameter. And it's pretty much a straight parallel cylinder shape. Um, and you're gonna make depth grooves with it. So depth grooves, as you can see on the picture here, this depth groove um, is about 1.5 millimeters deep. And after you make, it, make that depth groove, you're gonna reduce one side of the tooth, like here, one half of the incisal edge. And as you reduce it, you're gonna extend the depth by from 1.5 to around two millimeters or so. Two millimeters, you should not go over two millimeters, okay? Um, so ideal is two millimeters of overall reduction, okay? So as you reduce this one half, you're gonna get to about two millimeters. And after you do that, you do the other half, right? And you just follow the one half that you've already done as a reference. So you get even reduction of the incisal edge of two millimeters all around. And the purpose of reducing this much is to get enough porcelain thickness for strength and also for enough translucence. And after that, you're going to reduce the lingual side of the incisal edge here. You see there's very little space between the opposing tooth and the lingual side of the inc uh, incisal edge. You're gonna use a 744 carbide burr about 1.4 millimeters in diameter, you're gonna to reduce to about 1.0 to 1.5 millimeters um, of clearance. So this is called the lingual clearance. So as you can see, after you reduced enough, there's, uh, there's about 1.0 to 1.5 millimeters of space between the tooth and the opposing tooth. If you have an RGS instrument, you can use RGS-3. Uh, it's about 1.0 millimeters uh, in diameter and it, it should move freely in the space without hitting anything. And porcelain thickness, of course, uh, the reason for doing this is for porcelain thickness there because that's where the bite is. Um, so you need adequate thickness there. 
Um, and next step, step four, is you're going to reduce the facial surface of the tooth. So same thing as incisal edge, you're going to reduce, you're going to create depth grooves sort of as a guide, okay, before you start reducing. So first, start by using 57010, the same bird for depth groove, and create about one point of millimeters of depth groove, but in two planes, because the incisal edge has two planes. You have the incisal half, and then a different plane at the cervical half. So this is the cervical half, and this is the incisal half. And you do that, and you start reducing using a A56016 diamond burr. Um, use this burr to reduce, to, to, to connect the depth groups, right? As you can see, where I'm pointing here, the incisal half of the tooth, the depth groups have been connected. And as you do that, you have to follow the contour of the tooth, the curvature, natural curvature of the tooth. That way you get an even reduction of the facial surface all around, okay? And as you do that, you're going to end up um, deepening the depth a little bit, just like how you did with incisal uh, reduction. And as you reduce the facial surface, you're gonna go from 1.0 to about 1.5 millimeters of reduction. And the reason for having this much reduction, again, is for enough room. Remember PFM is three layers, metal, opaque, and porcelain. You need about at least 1.0 millimeters of space for all three layers to coexist and have adequate space for good aesthetics. Okay, and before we move on to the facial margin, let's talk about margin designs, okay? So facial is going to be porcelain butt joint, okay? Facial, the margin is gonna end in porcelain and it's gonna be a porcelain butt joint. And it's this type of margin is also called, on the, on the tooth preparation, it's called a shoulder margin, okay? And as you can see on the picture on the right, it's a 90 degree with sharp internal line angle here, 90 degree with a, sort of like a tabletop margin here with the rest of the nub of the tooth. And the depth of this margin is around 1.0, 1 1.5 millimeters, okay? That's the facial shoulder margin. That's only gonna be on the facial side of the tooth. And on the lingual side, it's going to be the metal collar. The lingual side of the crown is gonna end in metal, right? And when you end in metal, you get a metal collar margin. And on the tooth preparation, this type of margin is called the chamfer margin. And the chamfer margin is slightly different because as you see on the picture on the bottom, it's not 90 degrees, it's sort of rounded. Internal line angle, there's not really an internal line angle, it's sort of rounded, right? And the depth of the margin is around one point, uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 millimeters, okay? Very shallow. And in between, in a proximal, right, where the contact area is to the adjacent tooth, that area, the margin will be sort of a mix of the two, shoulder and the chamfer. So it will be a shoulder, a shallower shoulder, but it will be sort of a beveled shoulder. So it will be shoulder, and the facial and then transitioning bevel shoulder and into a complete chamfer at the back, okay? So the facial reduction for the margin part at the bottom of the facial will be shoulder margin. And you need a 1.0 to 1.2 millimeters of reduction. Um, this will provide enough room for metal opaque and porcelain. Ideally, I would go for 1.2 millimeters. And you can use a A56016 diamond burr as you did before. And uh, the diamond, uh, diamond, uh, this diamond burr has about 1.0 millimeters of diamond at the tip, so you can use that as a reference for depth. And because it's super gingival, you're going to have some tooth structure that is not prepared below the margin of the tooth, margin of the preparation, right? As you can see on the picture, after the margin of the preparation and before the gum line, there's some tooth structure that has not been prepared, right? And that is called the emergence profile. And that emergence profile should be about half a millimeter thick, okay? And of course, the margin has to follow the gum line, the curvature of the gum line. So you get an even reduction and also an even emergence profile all around. As you can see, I drew, I drew a black line here following the contour of the gum. Quiz number five, which of the following is true about number nine, PFM? Facial margin is a porcelain chamfer. It is not. 
facial margin is a porcelain butt joint. Chamfer margin is shallower and rounded. That's for metal margin. You don't want a shallow margin for porcelain because you need enough thickness for porcelain. If you have a chamfer margin for porcelain, because of the roundedness, the porcelain is going to end in a very sharp and thin edge. And that is a recipe for porcelain fracture. Porcelain gains in strength from thickness, OK? Metal, you can have a thinner metal, like a chamfer margin, because metal will not fracture like a porcelain would. There are two facial planes, not, not three. And uh, this reduction is about 2.0 millimeters, not 1.0 or 1.5. That's too shallow. Uh, remember, in size of reduction, you need enough in size of reduction for porcelain thickness, for strength, and also for enough room for translucence to happen, translucent effect. Subgingival margin is more aesthetic. That's true because the margin will not show. It's covered by the gum line. Number six, why is it important to have 1.0 to 1.5 millimeters of lingual clearance? Incisal edge translucence, that's more for incisal edge reduction. Metal is 1.0 millimeters thick, that is not true. Metal is about 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters thick in a PFM crown. Enough porcelain thickness, that's true. Crown should not contact the opposing tooth. That is not true. Crown should make contact with the opposing tooth, right? If you don't make contact, you could have super eruption of the opposing tooth, meaning the tooth starts, opposing tooth starts erupting. What if I reduce, okay, so what happens if you under reduce or over reduce certain aspect of the preparation, right? Let's say, okay, let's, let's start with the uh, ideal, right? Ideal is even reduction. Even reduction means you get even thickness of porcelain all around. It's more anatomical. Even thickness of tooth that's remaining. What you don't want, under reduce. Under reduction, what happens, right? If you under reduce, there's too much tooth structure remaining and not enough room for the crown. When you have not enough room for the crown, you get thinner crown in the area where it's under reduced, right? Then that area might be darker. The, the, the crown in that under reduced area might be darker because there's less porcelain. The metal will be same thickness, but because there's less room for the crown, now the porcelain will be reduced, which means some of the metal might show through. So it is, it's unesthetic and also weaker because it's not thick enough. Um, uh, another consequence of under reduction is the lab tech might look at the prep and be like, oh, this part of the crown prep is under reduced. There's not enough space. But if I make a crown too thin, then it's going to be too thin and weak. You know what? I'm going to make it thicker. And, and when, once the lab tech does that, then the crown ends up looking too bulky. And another uh, problem is over reduction. If you drill a certain area too much, right? beyond the parameters that I mentioned, then there's a small chance that you might get too close to the pulp, the nerve and the velocity of the tooth. And you could get a pulp exposure, which is the worst case scenario. If you get a pulp exposure, then the tooth is going to get infected and we'll need a root canal, right? But if you get, if you don't, even if you don't get a pulp exposure, if you over reduce, you get too close to the pulp, then the patient might have some post-operative sensitivity, some pain afterwards, you don't want that. Um, okay, next step is proximal clearance. Proximal meaning the sides of the tooth, right? Where, where the contact with the adjacent teeth is. That's the proximal slash interproximal area, right? You want to reduce this area to get a proximal clearance. So you want to use this really long burr, really skinny long burr called 850014 burr. The, it's also called a flame burr. Good, good way to remember because it's kind of, kind of catchy name, flame burr. It's about 0.6 millimeters of diameter at the tip, okay? So use that as a guide. And you want to get about 0.5 millimeters of gingival clearance. So when you break the contact and when you create the margin at the gingival area, 
you want to uh, uh, you want to go down enough, lower the margin enough until you get about 0.5 millimeters of space between that margin and the adjacent tooth. Okay, so the gingival clearance is right here, where the margin of the inner proximal area is, and to the adjacent tooth, it's about 0.5 millimeters. I like to remember this burr um, by this way: flame the contact, right? You're using a flame burr and you're removing the contact, right? The contact. So it's a good way to remember this instrument for this purpose. And after you break the contact and get gingival clearance, you want to have uh, a taper, a convergence, right? Of the mesial and distal areas. But you don't want too much convergence. You want just enough convergence. Around three to five degrees of taper on each side, around six to 10 degrees of total taper. You don't want too much taper, right? Or, or too little taper, right? If you have like too little taper, almost like negative taper, then you get a divergence, right? Then the crown will not seat because it's undercut. If it's parallel, crown will seat, but it, it will be very difficult to seat the crown because of too much friction. If it's slightly convergent, then it will be easier to crown the seat, uh, uh, seat the crown, right? And still have enough friction to retain the crown. But if it's too convergent, then you can seat the crown, but you can easily pop out, right? Makes sense? Kind of intuitively makes sense, right? And of course, when, while you're performing this step, avoid damaging the adjacent tooth. You can avoid damaging the adjacent tooth by aiming the burr is uh, a little bit a little bit inside of the contact, right? So you don't want to aim the burr right at the contact. You want to aim the burr slightly inside so that there's a small shell of tooth structure that will be left uh, next to contact as you're prepping. And then and the small shell of tooth structure, you can flick it away later, okay? Number seven, quiz. What is not a consequence of under-reduced axial preparation? Axial meaning sort of like the vertical walls that you're prepping. So if you under-reduce it, are you gonna get a too thick of a crown? You can, because the lab tag is going to be like, oh, this tooth is under-reduced, like I said before. And he might think, oh, um, the tooth, uh, the, the crown is going to end up being thin if I try to maintain anatomical crown, right? So the lab tag might compensate by creating a thicker crown, which might look too bulky. Or the lab tag might just create a thin crown, right? And darker shade of crown is also a possible consequence of under reduction because if the crown is fabricated too thin, the underneath metal layer, the darkness might show through because the porcelain is too thin. But pulp damage will never happen with under reduction. Pulp damage only happens with over reduction. You reduce the tooth structure too much to getting too close to the pulp. Okay, and next step is lingual reduction, the backside of the tooth. Uh, we're gonna start with the margin first. So you're gonna create a chamfer margin, like I said on previous slide, because you're going to have a metal collar margin uh, of the crown at the backside of the tooth. And remember, this, is, this type of margin is more sharp and shallow than a porcelain butt joint slash shoulder margin, correct? So the dimensions, as I said before, is going to be 0.3 to 0.7 millimeters of depth at the margin. Um, and a great burr for this purpose is 877010 because it has a nice chamfer shaped taper at the tip right here. And it's around 1.0 millimeters um, of diameter and it's even diameter all around. So you wanna sink the burr about halfway, right? To get around 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters of margin. And as you do this though, keep in mind um, you're going to have to maintain, because you're going to end up reducing the lingual side quite a bit, not just creating the margin. You're going to also create, as you create the margin, you're going to also create the lingual wall right here, right? The axial wall on the lingual side, right? So as you do this, make sure you maintain at least around 1.5 millimeters or more of the axial height. This is the axial height where I'm pointing to, the lingual wall, right? And of course, with when it comes to taper, of any of the axial wall, like the vertical wall of the crown prep, all around you want six to 10 degrees of total taper. So in this case, same thing, the lingual surface, the lingual wall has to maintain six to 10 degrees of total taper with the labial surface. 
So make sure to make sure as you're prepping this side to keep checking the preparation from the top, like on the top picture right here, to make sure you can see even amount of axial wall on both sides, right? And next step is going to be uh, the lingual fossa. Lingual fossa is right here, right? So we just did the lingual margin and the axial wall. Now we're at the lingual fossa. So lingual fossa, we gotta, there's one thing we have to consider. So for PFM crowns, because it's metal and porcelain, there's uh, uh, on the lingual side um, is usually a metal margin, which means at some point in the, in, in the lingual side, the porcelain and the lingual interface will be present, right? We have to decide where this interface is going to be, right? You don't want the interface of the porcelain and the metal to be on where the opposing tooth contacts because this interface is not, it's susceptible to fracture if you chew on it, if you bang on it, right? With the opposing tooth. So you wanna make sure the opposing tooth contact is away from the interface. So it will, the contact will either be on the metal, in which case the metal might extend from the margin to the fossa quite a bit, or it will be on porcelain, in which case the metal is gonna end pretty early and then the porcelain is gonna be the rest of the fossa, right? Ideal will be to be on metal because metal is stronger, right? Less susceptible to fracture from contact than porcelain. So unless it's an aesthetic concern, metal is probably better on the lingual contact. And this is how you reduce it. So you use a 7404 football bear uh, we saw this earlier on with lingual clearance, incisal lingual clearance step. Uh, you want about 1.0 to 1.5 millimeters of reduction. The burr is about 1.4 millimeter in diameter. So you can use that as a guide. And of course, as you reduce, you want to maintain 1.5 millimeters of axial height. Like here, as you reduce the fossa, you want to maintain 1.5 millimeters of axial, lingual axial height, okay? Because you're gonna reduce the cingulum here. Cingulum is like around this area, the convexity. As you reduce the cingulum, don't reduce it, uh, um, you're gonna end up reducing some of the axial wall, right? But you don't wanna do it too much overextended and get too short of an axial wall, okay? So maintain about 1.5 millimeters or more of axial height as you do this. And you have to maintain, um, yeah, uh, enough incisal edge thickness as well because the fossa, as you can see, extends to the incisal edge, right? From, um, from the, Singulum to the incisal edge, that's the fossa. So as you reduce the fossa, maintain, make sure the incisal edge is not thinned out too much. Basically, uh, of, uh, get even reduction all around the fossa, including the mesial and distal line angles right here. But do not overextend anywhere, okay? Do not overreduce anywhere. That's the axial height right here, maintain 1.5 millimeters. And the last step here, step seven, almost done, is to finish and refine. So oftentimes when you use a uh, A56 burr for the margins right here, you, because the burr at the tip is rounded, it's not like a flat burr, right? You often get these projections at the outside edges of the margin right here. They're called J margins, right? So these projections have to be flattened out smooth and blended with the rest of the margin. A great burr for this is, uh, 1008 39 burr because this burr is non this burr is non cutting all around here it's only cutting at the tip okay so it's a great burr for smoothing out the margin to a nice smooth finish and for the rest of the rest of the prep you want to round off any sh really sharp corners and edges because um, those are areas where um, it might fracture easily but you don't want to round it out too much just round out any areas that are like too sharp or uh, too sharp corner or too sharp edge. And the axial walls, try to smoothen them out. You can try using a 8856 uh, diamond burr. It looks very similar to an 856 diamond burr, but it's more of a fine diamond burr. Um, smoothen out the prep. And this, should, this is what it should look like by the end. You can see here, the margin follows the gum line. You have about 0.5 millimeters of emergence profile, even reduction of the margin all around, facial um, porcelain bud joint right here, shoulder margin, and the mesial and distal, mesial and distal um, inclinations to taper is very minimal, right? Three to five degrees convergent. And the, in, uh, the corners of the incisal edges are 
um, rounded. And you have about two millimeters of incisor reduction, enough lingual clearance here. Uh, you, have, you can see enough lingual clearance right here on this photo. Um, and the inner proximals are uh, beveled shoulders here. And as you can see from the top view, you have adequate lingual fossa reduction. You have um, um, shallower, shallower um, lingual chamfer margins compared to the facial porcelain margins. I mean, uh, shoulder margins and facial. Um, and incisal edge, adequate incisal edge thickness. Yeah, so basically from the top, you wanna to see even reduction all around and also even walls all around. This is the summary. Uh, if, you need, if you need to refer to this uh, later, you can take a picture of this and bring it to your lab. And to inspire you guys, to motivate you guys to achieve excellence, here is some beautiful PFM preps done by an extraordinary dentist. Um, with enough practice and following the right parameters, you can achieve beauty in crown preps. Crown preps can be art as well, as with many things in dentistry. You can see how they're very even and very smooth, and they're just aesthetically pleasing to look at. So this, this is something that um, dentists should try to strive for. And quiz number eight, what is the first step of, of a PFM preparation? Aesthetic evaluation, right? That is the first step. Where is the margin gonna be located and what type of margin are you gonna use on the facial and the lingual, right? Subgingival, supragingival, or butt joint or chamfer. Which burr is best? Uh, aesthetic, let me talk more about aesthetic evaluation. So if a patient, um, uh, if, the, if, the, if the tooth color is um, quite dark, for, for example, right? If you have a sub super gingival margin, you're gonna have a nice shade of tooth, a uh, nice shade of the crown, but it's very hard to match with the tooth. You're gonna have to make the crown really dark and it's not gonna look that great, right? So in those situations, it's a good idea to lower the margin below the gum line, sub gingival, right? To hide the darkness of the tooth. Right, and then everything, anything you see beyond the gum, right, it will just be the crown, right? And you can totally make the crown shade like brighter and more aesthetic, right? So subgingival um, uh, margins are very beneficial in that sense uh, if you want to really improve aesthetics. Um, and also sometimes over time with age, people might experience some gum recession, and uh, and a subgingival margin, you know, may not show still if there's a little bit of recession, right? Because you still have um, some depth between the gum line and the margin, right? So there's, there's a lot of benefits to subjugal margin, but it's very technique sensitive. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but yeah, just giving you guys some introduction to subjugal margins. And okay, which burr is best for lingual fossa reduction? Football burr. I like to remember this as fossa is rounded, right? It's like a round concavity, right? And football burr is also kind of a round burr. So they sort of fit together like a locking key. That's how I remember it. Uh, remember the flame burr, flame the contact, right? So flame burr, A50, uh, uh, one, uh, A50 or one O burr will be used for you know, proximal um, clearance, proximal clearance, right? Okay, let me talk a little bit about these concepts called retention form. Um, so retention form, uh, I pretty much sort of gone over this before, but retention form is features that, features of a crown preparation that prevent vertical dislodgement of a crown, or at least minimizes the chance of a vertical dislodgement of a crown, right? Uh, when you put a crown on, if you have the crown pet taper that is like this, that's undercut, the crown will not even see. Right, it's impossible. If you have a parallel, it's, it's your crown might go through, might seat, but it'll be very tough because there'll be too much friction, right? But if you have it slightly convergent, then the crown will seat. And also there'll be some friction keeping it in place, right? It's, um, I'm trying to think of an analogy here. 
I, I, I guess I can't really think of an analogy at the moment, but that's, this is the best way I can describe it, right? And if you have minimal taper, it's not undercut, so the crown can seat, but the taper is not so much that it's still frac friction preventing the crown from easily dislodging, right? And you, if you combine this with like some kind of a glue, like a cement, dental cements, and fill in the gap between the crown and the tooth, then it will really will keep it in place, right? But if you have a taper that is too convergent like this, right? Then the crown would easily seat, but going up, there's barely any friction preventing it from going up, right? It's basically physics, right? So in that case, retention form is not good because there's too much taper and less friction. So vertical dislodgement is more likely. Um, another feature um, that helps with retention form, of course, I just talked about the taper, but also axial height, which means the vertical height of the crown prep, right? If you have a short crown prep, just think about it, just intuitively. If you have a short uh, uh, crown prep and you put a crown on it, that will be easier to take off than if it was a longer crown prep, right? Because there's less surface area axially, which means less friction axially, right? As opposed to if you have a longer crown prep, there's more, more areas for friction, right? Preventing the possibility of a vertical dislodgement, right? So um, generally we require three millimeters or more of axial height for a crown that can be cemented. Of course, um, I'm not gonna go into depth here, but uh, there's a difference between cementing a crown versus bonding a crown. Ceramics can be bonded. So the advantage of bonding is that the, the crown almost physically glues on, glues on to the tooth structure into the microporosities of the tooth structure. So in that case, you don't really need as much retention form because you can have a, you can have a shorter crown prep and still have the crown retain well because the crown is like physically glued onto the tooth structure. Whereas if you cement it, you're only relying on friction and physics. So in that case, you would need a taller crown prep and minimal taper of the crown prep. Resistance form is our features that prevent not vertical, but lateral dislodgement of the crown. In this case, you want a narrower prep, not a wider prep. A wider prep is more likely to dislodge a crown in an oblique fashion like this versus a, a longer, uh, not longer, but narrower prep like this. Which of the following, last question, which of the following has good retention form? Shorter tooth? Nah, -uh, you want longer tooth. More taper? Nah, -uh, you want less taper. So less taper is the answer. You want a narrower tooth? Narrower tooth is more so with resistance form, not retention form. Okay, and let me uh, finally go over, after you're done with, the, okay, let's say you're done with the crown preparation and you wanna know whether you've under, under reduced or over reduced. You've been using your burr, the thickness of the burr as a guidance, right? But you wanna double check whether you've under reduced or over reduced, right? So before you crown prep, Make a putty stent. So you, a putty is like a, uh, a soft material that hardens. It's kind of like an impression material. You put it over the tooth before you prep it. And then you get an impression of the tooth and then you cut it in half, right? You can cut it facial uh, lingually, facial lingually, or you can cut it mesiodistally, okay? So if you cut it mesiodistally, you can, you can um, put, it, put it on the tooth like this. And when you prep the tooth, you're gonna have some space between the putty and the tooth prep, right? And through that, you can sort of see whether or not you've done an even reduction or not. And if you cut it facial lingually, you can put it on the tooth prep like this. And here, the prep already has been done and you can see that there's pretty even um, thickness or space all around the tooth. And that's what the crown will be, correct? And you can see here, uh, this is a mesodistal cut here. And you can see the facial reduction is even. And also on the right picture, you can see the inner proximal reduction, incisal size reduction, they're all even as well. Uh, this is a video clip. I'm not gonna play it right now, but um, during the real lecture, I will play this and this will be around five minutes long. Okay, lastly, last part of this lecture. Thank you guys for 
sticking it through with me. This part is going to be about how to how the crown is made, right? So this is the lab part of the PFN crown. So a dentist prepares a tooth, what you guys will do, and then takes an impression of the crown prep and sends it to the lab. And the lab will pour up a stone model. And then based on the stone model, the crown will be fabricated. So the stone model where the crown prep is on the stone model, the lab tech will do a wax up of the full contour crown. So an ideal crown form will be waxed up like this. And then after that, it will be cut back. The wax will be physically cut back um, to, a, to a thinner uh, form. And the lab tech will use a putty stent like you guys will do during prepping to evaluate whether the cutback was even. And the reason they did a cutback is that this wax is going to become metal and the cutback is enough space for porcelain that will be layered on top later on. So using the lost wax technique, which is basically um, melting the wax away and replacing it with metal, you'll get a metal coping. This is what, this is the metal layer of the PFM crown. And you can see there's still enough space um, here um, compared to the ideal crown, which should be filled with porcelain. So after they put the opaque porcelain layer on top of the metal to shadow, uh, to um, cover up the darkness, they will start layering porcelain. Porcelain, you can, it's like a powder form. You mix it with water and they become sort of like paintable almost. You can stack damp powder on top of these metals. And then once you have a nice contour, you can bake it heat it up and then it will become a very a tooth, tooth shade, very beautiful porcelain restoration. And this will be the delivery. So this is subject of a margin. Obviously you can't see the margin and obviously um, the porcelain has been done very well. You can see really good incisal translucence, um, sort of a gradient of shade from the cervical to the incisor and um, just all around very natural looking. Okay, uh, that was it for my lecture. Uh, I know that was a lot of information. So I'll be taking some questions from now on until whatever time we have left. And um, yeah, happy prepping. Okay.